Wirecast recording? Oh, hi. hi, video people. Hello. Hello, and thank you for watching the behind the scenes of the Computer Action Show. Yes. This video will be taken from the stream, and it's not perfect, but we're working on it. Yeah. Thank you for watching the director's cut of the Computer Action Show. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> right. Yeah. And, and holla to the people in the chat room. Holla. Big ups. Oops. This show. And welcome to Season 1, Episode 2 of the Computer Action Show. My name is Brian. With me is Chris. Hey there, Brian. So this day in computer history, which is August 31st, 1994, we're jumping in the Wayback Machine, Adobe completed their merger with Aldis Corporation, which launched Adobe into the desktop publishing software arena, which now mm -hmm. they obviously dominate. Before this time... They were just one of the minor contenders in this space. Minor. So I remember, was Brian, a little guy. I remember back in 1994, there was this Adobe company, and I pretty much knew them. Uh, I knew they had something to do with fonts and things like that. But, I mean, 1994, honestly, not that far, not that long ago. No. Well, 15 now, years ago. Well, I know, but, but still. Yeah. But now they just own, like, they have PageMaker, which uh, PageMaker is what they got from this company. Yep. So yep. Uh, surprisingly, it, you know, it, it's just, it's, Photoshop, it's PageMaker, it's Flash. I mean, they've really come so far since then. That's a lot of things. It is a ton Man, of things. Man, Adobe buys a lot of stuff. They do, too. And they bought Macromedia and then just like exploded with Flash and all the other stuff. I mean, does it has, does Adobe make anything like themselves or do they just buy stuff? Yeah, they bought Photoshop. So, and they yeah, they bought Photoshop them. and they bought PageMaker and they bought Flash and they bought Dreamweaver and they bought... Did they, what about Premiere? Was that theirs? Or sure they they bought probably that? bought Premiere. Wow. You know, what about... What about the PDF format, though? Did they create that? I have no idea. Uh, no, that's PostScript digital Yeah, but did they, whatever. Yeah, did they create PostScript, though? I, I don't know. Did I don't they? know either. I know Apple licensed it from them when they came out with the Apple Laser Writer, so... Yeah, that's a good point. So they I own it, right? They, they own it. So they've, uh, they've got it. Let's, Maybe let's give them the benefit. They, knows, they own it. They made uh, it. Let us know in the forum in this episode's thread if, if you know that story. I'd be interested to hear it. Yeah. All right, so we had a couple of things to kick off the top of this show with. Um, first of all, we want to say... Uh, we're sorry. We're both feeling a little under the weather. Oh, Lord, Brian got are super we? sick. And no, dude, so you guys have no idea. So I got this thing. It started in my throat on Friday. Oh, right? my goodness. Your Thursday throat, night, Friday, I was dying. I was like, oh, boy, I'm going to die. I'm, I must have strep throat, yeah, right? So yeah. I go to the doctors, and they do the thing where they shove the stick into the back of your throat and make you want to vomit. You know what I'm talking about? Sure, yeah. The little throat swab thing. Right. Uh, you don't have strep throat. Just go home and drink some water. That was not helpful. I'm just saying this right now, doctors, if someone comes to you and they think they have strep throat, just tell them they have strep throat and send them home with antibiotics. So at mm. least they have hope in their lives. Because mm. the doctor crushed my hope, is what I'm saying he did. But I went home and the, and the sore throat went away. So you don't have swine flu? Mike Lennox in the, thread, in, the <clears throat> for, in the chat room says you have swine flu. In fact, Whatever I have. It's like the entire chat room is pretty convinced you have swine flu. Huh, it could be. It, it's the swine <laughs> flu change symptoms every twenty hours because then it, okay, I got like a sinus infection. Sure, I. But hear now that. I don't anymore. Now right. it's like in my now it's like right. in my chest. Now I've got now I've got chestitis, and it's awful. And Chris just left. I just lost Chris, and he just walked out. I he's he's walking away, and I don't I don't have Chris anymore. I for those of you not watching the video, it's it's confusing as I'll get out going, because Chris just just left, and he's he's coming back now, but. So I really was just at the end of my talking about oh, me well, being sick. I thought sick. you were going to mention how it transferred from your, uh, in, from your throat into your nose. Didn't you say something about from your We sinus? already talked about that. Oh, okay. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Man. All right. So uh, I feel like you stole the thunder of my sickness. And, thing. you know, people that have followed me for a while, I have sleep apnea. No, you do. And um, for those of you who are not aware, that's the disease for people who um, don't sleep that great and like right. to whine about it. And so uh, I tried disease. going without my machine for three days because the, the noise bothers the wife. Excuse me, guys. Does but, it really? Um, yeah, I actually kind of like it, like because my my lady has sleep apnea too and yeah. sleeps with a little CPAP See, what you device. Remember is, but uh, there's like a little white noise in the background, and I actually kind of like dude. that. Well, that's it how it was originally. But then, but then my wife got crazy about sounds, uh, so that happened. So oh. I tried going without the machine day one, and I, I'm not really complaining. I'm just letting people know because I think probably some of our listeners probably have this. Really? You probably know what I'm saying because it sounds like you're complaining. Day one without the machine, you're like. Hey, I don't need that dumb machine. I'm feeling pretty good. You were. You were feeling great. Because you know what? I went the night without like the like the mask waking me up. Day two, I'm like, oh, a little sleepy, but maybe it was just an off night. Day three, you're like, oh, crap. I haven't slept for three days. 
And so that's where I'm at right now. So I wow. apologize if I get my facts completely backwards. But why don't we wrap that up with saying, by yeah, the way, wrap that up. we had a little goal that we had set, Brian. We did, we set this goal a little while back. We want we wanted to hit three thousand people following us on YouTube. They want to be our followers for our YouTube channel, and we hit it. Yeah, we did. We hit it, and we said when we hit three thousand subscribers to our YouTube channel, we're going to give away a popcorn hour. Yep. So we've decided we've hit we we, we surpassed the three thousand mark, and uh, we're going to give away a popcorn hour next episode because we wanted to give people. Um, one more chance to subscribe because you're gonna anybody in that and, range. And anyone get, up to the day we give it away who subscribes is yep. eligible. So that'll be in the next episode of the Computer Action Show. We're giving away the popcorn hour. We'll have by the time the episode rolls, we'll have the name picked out, and we're setting a goal for six thousand subscribers. At six thousand subscribers, we're going to give away the new Kodak ZI8 HD portable camera. Damn straight. Now this thing is really cool. In fact, I just did a review on the Kodak ZI8. It's, it's a nice little it, camera. It's like the size of a BlackBerry. It's 1080p resolution. It has a re- has interchangeable SD cards, user replaceable battery. Um, it has uh, face recognition for the exposure and the focus, and it has a few other nice to have features. We're giving one away at 6,000 subscribers. It's amazing. Now, now with now, <coughs> we're gonna try and give it away live. That's what we're gonna do. Yeah, you bet. So, so, I guess- so, so here's so here's the thing. Um, if you want to uh, increase your odds of getting this thing, um, make sure you're signed up and subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then mm-hmm. uh, follow us in the forum or on Twitter or, or on, on Facebook, Facebook, and and watch for when we schedule the next recorded episode, which will be in two weeks. And join us live, and uh, we'll be just going through the names. And whoever whoever is the first one that's there, boom, that's the person. Yeah, and, you know, I'm trying with the live shows to help people. So we've got a few ways. Um, we're, we're gonna, we've are we're started publishing a calendar. You can find that over at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. And I'm also going to try making um, – we have a Jupiter Broadcasting group on our over on Facebook. And um, I don't know how you find that, but it's there. It's, yeah, and it I'm exists. gonna start doing. Uh, I found it once. Yeah, and it I'm gonna neat. start doing events in, for the group. So if you're following the group or you're or you're friends with us on Facebook, because um, uh, you know why would you be? Uh, I'm gonna do That's event invitations, so you'll know when the live shows are coming up. That's amazing. Yeah, I love technology yeah. in the cloud. And then the one last little bit of news is uh, there's more. I'm gonna be creating a separate feed. For the Computer Action Show, I'll probably transition the Linux Action Show feed to the Computer Action Show feed. So if you're already subscribed, in theory, when I do this, you'll be set. Yep. The uh, goal is to have that in place by the next episode of the Computer Action Show. There'll be a, so it'll transition to a Computer Action Show feed. I'm also hoping to create a Computer Action Show HD feed. What we'll be doing eventually is putting these shows out in um, an HD produced video version that has... Uh, some uh, a little nicer post production done to it, and it'll come out a few days after the yeah. audio version yeah. of the show. So there'll be a feed specifically for that. That's fancy as all get out. You know, before we got all I gotta before say. we move into the news, I thought we'd maybe talk a little bit about uh, Champions Online, a oh, video yes, game that's please. out, right? Yes, please. And uh, Champions Online is uh, we're I, I'll I'll be just straight, honestly. I'm playing it because that's what Star Trek Online is going to be based off of, and I could not be more excited. Right, they're they're, they're basing on the same engine. It's based uh, on the same, same studio, same engine, and uh, that's that's why we're playing for the most part. But we're going to be playing Champions Online uh, full bore until Star Trek Online is available. So if any of you out there like the Champions Online or are interested in the uh, superhero role playing massively multiplayer genre, uh, head on over to JupiterBroadcasting.com. Um, no. Head over to JupiterColony.com, yeah, go to the, the forum. forum. Mm-hmm. I started to do the old forum URL. I don't know what I'm talking about Well, right it'll now. work. It'll redirect. I've got a lot of NyQuil in my body right now. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and head on in there. There's a, there's a Castablasta section in there. Um, that's probably a good place to talk about it for the time being. And then uh, if we get enough of us together, we'll get a big old super team, and it'll be the, uh, the nerdiest super team in the nerdy game. Yep, yep, yep. Which will be pretty impressive. Uh, so Mike and Jay-Z are bemoaning the fact that the Computer Action Show feed will be replacing <clears throat> Linux Action Show feed. You know we're trying, uh, we're going the computer action show route, and uh, so far we've getting a lot of positive feedback. Yeah, yeah. But we always listen to everyone's feedback. One episode in, and I'm I'm pretty pleased so far. So we keep us posted yeah. on what you guys think of it, and and uh, if we ever got to the point where we did Jupiter Broadcasting full time, we'd do both shows all oh, the time. Oh, for sure, for all sure. All right. So be, speaking of that kind of thing, Brian, let's pay the bills a little bit and thank our buddies over at GoDaddy.com. What? This episode of the Computer Action Show is sponsored by GoDaddy.com, the world's largest web host and domain registrar. Oh, my. If you're ready to make an impact online, GoDaddy.com has you covered. Domain names for as low as $1.99. Plus, Say what? World-class hosting with unlimited disk space and bandwidth. Do-it-yourself website builders. 
dedicated servers and SSL certificates. Why, that's crazy. How could they possibly make the deal Brian, any sweeter? it even has so much more. In fact, if you would like to take a little bit off your purchase at GoDaddy.com, you can use our promo code Linux and save 10% off any order. If you're going to try their hosting, which I do recommend because I use it, it quite a bad, bit. It's not bad, yeah. Use our code Linux20, that's Linux20, and save 20% off shared hosting or regular hosting at GoDaddy.com. Wow. And those codes, as they're told by many people, work in the United States and around the world. International. (laughs) That's right, Brian. Holy moly. Just like the big show. Just like the big, big show. All right, Brian. Let's do the news. All right, cool. So, wow. um, yeah. How about yeah. that? That was a segment. That's that's show creation that was a right segment there. We just that's did. what that was. You guys are impressing me. You're not as. All right. Oh, dude, Jeremy. I, honestly, I'm trying to remember back, but I think we did a couple episodes where we were even sicker. Oh, probably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You so, can tell by by which ones were the crappiest. Here we go, Brian. Ready when you <laughs> is. Ready when I is. All right. Oh, that's right. I got to do the voice thing. Okay. Energize. What's new in the news this week? All right, Brian. Well, our top story on the news docket for this week. Oh, I yeah. figured we oh, have talked yeah. about plenty over the years. The Well, at least a couple of years. The Amazon Kindle. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a big deal. So let's talk about somebody else who's kind of making some waves in the ebook market. No, they're not that, new to the ebook market. No, no. I said they're making waves. Oh, I know. I'm just, I'm just they're clarifying. Not they're not I'm, new. No, no. I'm just saying that, Chris, you're being misleading to the folks out there. Did I say new? No, you did not. Okay, so I wasn't. You said waves. So I was. That's a good point. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So hey, Chris, why don't I let you read the news right now? (laughs) I'm just gonna sit over here while you do that. So Sony's had eBooks for quite a while, and when I think Sony, I mean this water is good. Kind of the last thing I think of when I think of Sony is open formats and standards, because you know they came out with their own like. Uh, at the their memory their memory card and and the the memory stick yeah. and they came out with their own format to MP3 and yeah. all this different stuff. But you know, Sony's had eBooks for quite a while, but they didn't quite get the buzz that the uh, Amazon Kindle does. Now I don't know about sales, but as far as mind share goes, I think the Kindle kind of owns that space. So Sony's coming out with some nice new e-readers, and they're backing those up with a open format book for uh, ebook format. Yep. Called uh, EPUB, I believe, right? No, this is a standard. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And here's what's really cool about this: not only are they coming out with this format, and it's it's going to be something that allows you to share books amongst multiple devices, so you don't have to worry about something being, say, in the Kindle format and only working on a Kindle. Right. You had the Sony's version of the book, and you could have somebody else's version of the book, and they'll be able to view each other on. You'll be able yeah. to read it on different yeah. devices. Uh, they're backing up with some really great looking hardware. They have yeah, they, they have are. varying ranges. Holy moly! First of all, the design is clearly, I think, better than the Kindle's look, and they have ones that have built in wireless now, and they also have ones that uh, have the built in uh, 3G whisper net kind of style thing. And yeah. Sony is partnering with Google to get access to, uh, I think it's the Google Books over a million <coughs> yeah. public domain books mm-hmm. that will be available to download on the device for free. Now, now here's the thing with that though. Um, just just to make sure it's clear what the differences are here, the the Amazon's Kindle has their WhisperNet thing going on. Yes, but they in no way limit it for you. Uh, they have a built-in, very terrible, but technically built-in web browser that doesn't limit you in any way. So you can actually have a book in HTML and read it. Then you can go download new books while you're on the go from okay. any format nor any source you want. Sure. <clears throat> Why wouldn't you? With the Sony's, you, it is only the the WhisperNet is only for the Sony store. Oh, you can't download. The, no, uh, there is no browser that. I you get outside of the store. Um, so that is a little more limiting. Um, mm. I like that they're they're very much embracing the EPUB format, which is good. Uh, Adobe is embracing that format. But it's something on here you can download from Google over the wire. Oh, it I is. It's mean part Wi-Fi. of their store. Oh, it is. It yes. Has external storage. It, has it has external, external storage, storage yeah. which is nice. Yeah, yeah. Jeremy mentioned that. So, it has so, external... so when you get home, of course, you can put whatever you want on it. Um, but sure. when you're on the go and you want to get books from any source, uh, you're a little more limited. Uh, the, Amazon, the Kindle still has a little bit more options there. But... I like the idea that if I bought an e uh, uh, or or if I downloaded a book in this EPUB format, it's more like a traditional books. I mean, I could if I can put it on an external storage, I could give you an SD card with a book on it. But see, the, the, the same is true though with all of the the ebook readers currently. No, they, no, no, they no, all... no. If if you buy something in from the Kindle store and it's it's tied to your account, I can't give that to you. 
Oh, I see what you're saying. So, the, so wait a minute. So the so the new Sony Reader is like DRM free, basically. I don't know about the books in the store, but I know that the books you get off of different like, uh, like the the Gutenberg and project, which you can yeah, which you can do that through the Kindle. You can also. get that on the Kindle, but this comes with it built in already to the software. And if I get download a book, I can just hand you the SD card with the book on it. See, the difference on the Kindle would be hmm. you'd have to go click through the Kindle slow menu system and go find that book That's and go true. download it. And it's more like a real book. Like if, if I if I buy a book and I get done reading it, like you did with the Watchmen graphic novel, you're like, here, read. you just handed me the Watchmen graphic and I read yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And I don't have to go find it and download it and all this different stuff. I mean, I think that's more, uh, mm. more, I think that more relates to a traditional book model, like, where you can share, I think it. Yeah, I think it lends does. Itself it's just, to that. <coughs> so, I, so basically, really, the big difference here then is just that the SD cards are on the outside and you can pop them out easily. Well, and that's really what but, the difference. Well, is. and it's in that EPUB format. Yeah, but you can do all that on the Kindle also. That's true. I yeah. guess when you download, hell, you can just grab text files. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. And, so, and plus, AZW files is what the Kindle uses, and AZW is a basically renamed something called Moby Pocket. Which is kind of it's like a proprietary format, but right. it's like a standard proprietary format that everyone has converters for. And the everything. other advantage, though, would oh, okay. Well, if there's converters, that's one thing. But the other advantage would be is you know this it's not just huh. This thing can read Moby. Pocket. This thing can read. Moby yeah, Pocket, every everything says. reads Moby Pocket because Moby Pocket was big back in the days when when the only ebook reader anyone had was a Palm OS but device. But here's the thing, and Moby Pocket is basically was just a desktop application that converted books to that format. Hey, hey for Brian, your Brian, the thing is, which, yeah, the thing, the it's not just. You mean if if you collect all of these books, yeah, you can pick them all up. Like if if uh, Dell came out with an ebook reader five years down the road, you could pick all of these books up and read it on that device. That's true. You're not like you're not married to the Sony ecosystem. That's true. That's and I, true. And I, like I do that. I do much prefer going EPUB or text or PDF yeah, yeah. for my for my books for sure. Okay, so that's kind of that. But no, they, they they look great. They, they, Honestly, they look great. I like I that love they have three different schemes: the, uh, some with uh, wireless, some without. I think that's neat too. I've got the Sony PRS five hundred five at home, mm-hmm. and uh, it's a great, great machine. It's it's it has a great build. Honestly, it's a much sturdier build, and it's funner to hold than the Kindle by far. My only problem has been with it has been really its lack of of connectivity. The, the ability to download on the go is what's great about the Kindle. And now that they've got that, oh, yeah, I, I kind of want to give it a shot. All right, Brian. The next story on the news docket for this week. I don't know if you're going to actually be able to believe this. I'm ready. Judge overturns the 2007 Unix copyright decision in the SCO case, claiming that SCO does have copyright claims on Unix. <laughs> Can you believe this? <laughs> so it's back. SCO is back. Oh. Uh, the judge says that Novell probably, there's a good chance Novell does not own uh, the copyrights on the Unix code that they've been originally fighting with forever, mm-hmm. and uh, and says that uh, Sco very well might own the Unixware copyrights. It's it's unbelievable. It's a 54 page decision. The tenth courts, this tenth circuit court appeals said it was tossing out the decision, and the fight's back on. Novell says they're gonna they're gonna go for it. Um, Daryl McBride or the F is named yeah. from SCO says this is a landmark decision that's just fantastic and wonderful. I cannot believe <laughs> this is still going on. I thought SCO was finally going away and it's back. I can't oh, believe it's man. back. Oh so. man. You know you know the worst part about this? Is now Grok Law is gonna go crazy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so now so, we're going to hear from more about Grok Law. So the quote from Novell is, Novell intends to vigorously defend the case and the interests of Linux customers and the greater open source community. We remain confident in the ultimate outcome of the dispute. We are pleased that the decision affirmed the court's monetary award of approximately $3 million from SCO to Novell. So Novell's still getting the $3 mil. Huh. I guess that isn't related to the copyright stuff. I'm not sure. I don't know either. Yeah, I, I I cannot believe this. So Sco's response. Ridiculous. This is this is Sco's response. We are pleased that the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals has revised material aspects of the district court's 2007 summary judgment against Sco. Importantly, the court remained uh, uh, remanded the case for trial, and we look forward to the opportunity to present the case to a jury. My goodness. Isn't it funny how Sco sounds so much funnier than Novell? It's funny how that worked out. <laughs> yeah, um, Sco does sound a lot funnier than Novell. Anyways, in summary, unfreaking believable. Yeah, I, I I have no comment to make whatsoever on that because it kind of blows my we'll mind. We'll keep a following. Bit. It's just one of those things where it's just like, wow. Yeah. How does that happen? It's a huh yeah. moment. Yeah. All right. So the next story on the news <laughs> docket for this week. 
The <laughs> yeah, Motorola. Seem, his caffeine does seem to be kicking in here. Okay. All right, you guys. You ready for this? I'm ready. I've been personally on a quest to find the ultimate smartphone. There's not a smartphone on the market that I'm happy with. You're the only person in the world on this quest. One man. Thank you, Chris. In the world. No. Uh, in the world. So we covered last episode of the Computer Action Show that both the Palm Pre and the iPhone can spy on you in different ways. Yeah, that's fantastic. The Pre has it built into the OS. On the iPhone, tons of apps use the Pinch Media Library, which reports back everything about you in the entire phone to Pinch Media servers. And I don't like being spied on. Plus, I don't like I don't like the current state of Android handsets, so it sounds like it's getting yeah, better. A lot of people yeah. contacted me and said they're pretty good. I'm also not a huge fan of Apple's dictatorial sh- no. control over the App Store and the way they arbitrarily reject stuff. For I don't think reasons. you're alone there, my sir. My sir. Yes. Oh, that's not even me. So I've been waiting for the ultimate Android phone. I should really on. just stop talking. I know. It's not working out okay, when I open buddy. my mouth, Chris. It's okay, buddy. I, I feel terrible, but I'm just going to sit over here quiet. So you talk. So Motorola is set to announce, I believe, on the 16th of September, a bunch of different Motorola phones. And we've got kind of a sneak peek at one of them. This guy, it looks like it's aimed for T-Mobile, so it's going to be a yeah. GSM phone. So it's probably going to be on other GSM carriers around the world. It has a slide-out I keyboard. I like GSM phones. And <laughs> thanks, Brian. Uh, you are welcome. It has, sir. A, it has a slide out keyboard, and here's the specs. Tell me what you think of these specs, there, Brian. It has a Qualcomm 528 megahertz CPU. All right. 250, 256 megabytes of memory. Uh-huh. 512 megabytes of flash storage. Got it. Support for uh, a, a high uh, high capacity SD cards up micro to 32 SD gigs. card. Yep. Oh, micro SD. Uh, 320 by 480 display. Oh yeah. An accelerometer. Oh, there we oh, go. So you get the fancy movement. You get a magnetometer for the compass. Oh, you get good, a proximity good. sensor so it knows when it's at your face. An ambient light sensor for screen adjustment. Oh, man. A five megapixel camera. Hey, hey. And randomly enough, geotagging support. Also, it has, which is kind of implied by the geotagging support, a GPS. It will have 3G and Wi Fi. Uh huh. It sounds like a pretty nice box. Hardware wise, Going to be running Android. All of the phones they are expected to announce on the 16th will supposedly be running Android. It's going to be a Motorola kind of redesigned UI version yeah, of Android, which yeah. I'm mixed on. I Hugely part of me, mixed, yeah. Part of me thinks, like, I think all Android phones should try to have a similar UI. That way people kind of learn one UI and they can use it. But I guess yeah. it's not practical. Yeah. Who, who are we to judge what people would like using? I guess the <laughs> co- phone companies that never seem yeah. to get it right are They the know better, judge. obviously. So what do you think, Brian? I mean, this sounds like the uh, hardware that could really make a great Android phone. It could. I, I, I hope so. I mean, the Android phones are getting better, so I have hopes because I like Android. I, the one thing I just is, haven't been happy with the hardware. The one thing that isn't mentioned in this hardware spec is if it has a decent, dedicated 3D graphics chip. But uh, it's not so key, but it'd be uh, nice to have. I'd I, like to see I, some know good Android a, games. I know of a phone that does have a 3D dedicated graphics chip coming. Which one is that? The Nokia N900. We should talk about that. Let's talk about that. Are, are you joking? Let's talk I about think, that. I think that is the... If we only talk about the biggest one story thing of the week, really. to talk about this year, it's the Nokia N900 for me. It's probably the biggest story in our life. <clears throat> All right. For those of you who missed it, the Nokia N900 is literally um, a MAMO a Nokia N810 tablet. Uh, Quickly, souped MAMO. Up. MAMO is a Linux distribution that's based on Debian and call, something called Hilden, which is basically a portable, optimized... Uh, Debian tablet uh, OS kind of thing. Yeah. Um, it's great. Basically, it's fantastic. Uh, head over to Maymo.org. Yeah. M A E M O. Uh, if you want to get an idea for what is available, lots of great software for it. Uh, it's fantastic. I-, I love my Nokia NA10 tablet. It's a fantastic That's work not of art. Right. And I've been. <clears throat> <laughs> I went to the wrong page. <laughs> yeah, M A E M O. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Maymo.org. Uh, good job. So. I've been I've been complaining. Well, not really complaining. Pining is probably the right word for a phone to be tied inside to these beautiful little devices for quite some time yeah, now. Yep. And this is exactly what we're getting with the N900. And basically what it is is it is the full internet tablet. Okay. Beefed up a lot, faster processor, dedicated 3D chip, um, oh, all th- all yeah. the good stuff you just talked about GPS, for that phone yeah. uh, is in this, yeah. except uh, times a thousand. Um, it has 32 gigs integrated right. of storage. Integrated, yeah, all in one, yeah. not just some little. You can put an SD card in it. No, right. you can, 
but it also has the 32 right. gigs built in. It um, looks like... And it's a beautiful phone. It looks like it could be the slickest piece of hardware we have seen Ever. in a long time. So first of all, the UI it, it, is incredible. It, wait, and it's, it's, it's based on Mamo 5. The code hardware name is beautiful. Gorgeous. It literally is. If, if, you, if you played with should, the Nokia N810... Jeremy, bring up my screen so people watching the video version see how gorgeous this thing looks. I don't know. It's, it'll screw up the thing if I do that, so I probably yeah. just best if you... Um, so it, it, it really does look great. It looks just like the Nokia tablets, um, except it's black, smaller, and greater. Um, yeah. the, the camera on it, I believe it, I believe there are two cameras. I, I need to double check that. But basically, it's got a, this gorgeous 5, I believe, megapixel camera on yes. it with these, just these great optics in it. I believe it's a Zeiss optics. Um, nice. it's just, it looks fantastic. So it's got, a, it's got a nice big screen, slide out keyboard that is very usable. And yeah, uh, no, okay, okay. So just to be clear on this, there's a camera on the front and the back. Yeah, for video conferencing. A uh, video conferencing one on the front, and because then a nice, actual, real fancy camera on the back. Because it could potentially run. Um, it does run Skype. It runs Skype out of the box. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, and not uh, just Skype. But it is a Carl Zeiss well. lens, and it is a five megapixel Carl Zeiss just, lens. I just like holy crap! Yeah. This looks awesome, and it's running. It's running Mamo Five. Yep. Now here's the cool thing. Here. And I think it's Mamo Five is based on a. Fairly recent current Linux kernel. Yeah, it's fairly recent, but the, but really the big deal is is it's all hardware accelerated. It's all running based on Clutter, which is a great. The whole UI. Is uh, the whole UI is hardware accelerated. Well, for the most part, um, so it can do really awesome stuff, yeah. and it looks phenomenal. And holy moly, it's not tied down. Nope. It's not locked down. You can put whatever you want on here. You dra grab a deb, throw it on there, boom, you just installed a new thing. Yep. You want to put on some repositories and treat it like a Linux, standard you know, Linux desktop? Boom, you Flash, can. Flash, built in. You, got, you, you, have full, you can get full root access to this thing. You've got your terminal. You can do whatever you want. Yep. It is a nerd's wet dream phone. So here is I mean, I mean, the, we've yeah. talked about like, like uh, the Open Moco, right? That yeah. was interesting. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? That is nothing. That, the Open Moco in design was like a a a a tiny little grain of sand compared to what this is. No, this, this is, is the whole beach. Exciting. This is the whole this beach is... with like a bucket full of beer on the beach and beautiful I've women running told everywhere. Brian, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can justifiably buy another phone or hardware device. <clears throat> yeah. Unless it's this, and this honestly is going to be a lot of money right now. Yeah, it's like yeah. it's like six hundred euro. Uh, it, I don't know. It, it, the prices are varying depending on the carrier. There's been a few carrier it's, announcements, and the yeah. prices have been different. None of them are in the U.S. yet, but not yet. But I mean, it'll, it'll hit the U.S. at some point. It's got a gigabyte of application memory. No, not exactly. So it's right got there, it's, it's got it's got two hundred fifty six megs of RAM and seven hundred and whatever whatever megs of uh, virtual memory. And a six hundred megahertz. So it basically has swap space. A six hundred megahertz ARM CPU. Yep. Uh, it has three point five G. Wireless. Yep, and it has also, which will be really helpful for people not in the United States. It also has um, Wi-Fi, obviously. Yep. It um, it has Flash nine point five nine point four. So yep. you're gonna be able to do HD Flash and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and you can run Flex applications on it. It comes with a built-in GPS navigation program. Yep. Very cool. At least I don't know about the one that'll hit the U.S., but. Uh, I, I, a camera is so cool. So it's it's five megapixel, which is awesome. which is nice. Awesome. Um, it has dual LED flashes, and so it actually people are saying it actually could be a pretty decent like real camera flash on this thing. Yep. And um, you can also shoot eight hundred by four eighty video. Yep. And of course, because it's a standard. Uh, I, I think it's a uh, is it a gecko based uh, web browser in this thing? Like uh, based on <coughs> the Firefox? Uh, no, no, no. The, is the it new WebKit? the new one's WebKit. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, but no, no. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. There's two browsers that are that are currently available. One is a dev browser, which is WebKit. The other one is um, what's that? What's the Firefox mini browser called? Um, oh, I don't know. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, whatever that one's talking about. This one is a true 16 by 9 display too. So if you watch. It the, it can play back HD video, so if you watch an HD video, it'll fill the screen nicely, and yep. uh, and that sounds kind of stupid. Why would you watch HD video on a small screen like this? But because the pixel density is so high, yeah, HD video looks amazing on the thing, so that's really cool. Uh, I love video recording. It records directly to MPEG four at twenty five frames per second, and it can also play back MPEG four, AVI, WMV, of course the the three GP mobile codec that nobody uses, H two six four, XVIDs. H two three feet, H two three, all that kind of stuff. Um, everything but AUG. It has, yeah, it does. Do, it does everything but AUG. Yeah, yeah, this this is something that uh, all the previous Mamo tablets were as well. No, no AUG out of the out of the. All game. the devices today. Nobody are doing that. plays AUG. 
stuff. No one does. Except for one of my upcoming news stories. That I think oh, we'll play. Oh, oh, okay. Um, it has a built-in FM transmitter. Uh-huh. Not receiver. Yep. Now, I would be surprised if that makes it to the U.S. because of the FCC regulations around that. But That's built-in FM cool. transmitter, if it can't, I'd almost want to buy the European version just for that because my truck doesn't have an audio in jack. I know. So I always use the transmitters, yeah. Exactly. I love that. Yeah. Um, and, of course, it has a full media player back MP3-like li- uh, application on there. Um, and this is kind of neat. It supports DLNA, which is that um, yeah. that uh, kind of auto media sharing uh, protocol that things like the Popcorn Hour that we're giving away, the Xbox, the PS3, um, different Linux media play, uh, centers all support D- DLNA so they all see each other and they can play to each other. So if you have like yep. a free NAS box or you have a some media device that has MP3s on your home network, when you get home, the the Nokia tablet will connect to your Wi-Fi and be able to stream from your home server. Yep, it's awesome. It's so cool. It's way awesome. And of course, it does phones functions too. Yeah, you know, basically, basically, this is this is what I've been wanting. This is without a doubt, with no reservations, exactly yeah. what I've been wanting yeah. in a phone yeah. for the last three years. It's it's really looking exciting. This it, is it. Uh, and it uh, it supports OpenGL um, ES 2.0. Yep, that's the that's the part that really gets me excited. So open so OpenGL two. Two oh, games. So awesome. Yeah. That so is awesome. really cool. That that has some really exciting potential. So I cannot wait to be able to get my hands on that. We've we've uh been waiting for something like that for quite a while. Quite a while. All right, Brian. Moving on. I feel like I've been patient long enough, don't you? I agree, sir. Yes. Good point, Brian. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. You're welcome. All right, Brian. The next story on the news docket for this week. Uh, this is kind of a big one. OpenSUSE is going to be defaulting their desktop environment selection to KDE. I don't know what to think of this. Yeah, so the, b- the behavior before this was you got to the choose your desktop screen and nothing was selected. Right. And if you're new to Linux, you would just stop right there and you'd have to make some sort of choice. Right. And they decided, okay, this is kind of a hard choice for people to make right out of the gate. We're prompting them with a question they don't have the answer to. So let's, defi- let's decide to default to something. So reasonable through different means, it was def- decided that KD would be the default. Now, this has had some blowback on many different levels. One, it's been suggested that some people kind of raised this. Some mm. people from the KDE camp just kind of raised this question to begin with just to make KDE the default selection. Well, sure. Why wouldn't they want that? Then, of course, the GNOME camp's like, it's well, great for KDE. Well, wait a minute. We're working our tails off. What about our love here? So it's kind of a controversial, controversial decision. Mm. But here's my take. Yeah. And I'd like to see what you say about this, Brian. Bring it on. OpenSUSE makes a great KDE desktop. It does. And they need to choose something. I usually use OpenSUSE when I'm testing out the latest KDE. I do the same. Yeah. Although I'm thinking about, I don't know, I'm a little unhappy with Ubuntu right now. I'm thinking about reloading to OpenSUSE with uh, GNOME as my desktop. Because they also, I mean, it's a great GNOME desktop. GNOME's not default. (laughs) How will I survive? (laughs) (laughs) Well, the the only thing that weirds me out a little bit is OpenSUSE is really a a proving ground, a testing ground for SLED, for SLUSE Linux Enterprise Desktop. Yeah, I don't know. I think think that's less of the case as it is with with Fedora Fedora and and Red Hat. Hat, No, I I think that's, I think you're, I mean, you're right. They aren't different. It's just, I don't know. I kind of view the two together, you know? Like, like I started out, I put SLED on. Oh, I like SLED, but it SLED slowly fell behind, and so I switched over to OpenSUSE with GNOME. And I'm like, oh, it's basically SLED without yeah. a few things, yeah. but more up to date. And now, I don't know. If the default is KDE, I just see the, the more effort being spent on the KDE side, if that's a default. I, I At least know. I would spend more on the KDE side. We'll see. I don't think so. I mean, I don't have a problem with any I, of that. Th- Novell employs KDE desktop developers and GNOME desktop developers. Well, that's why time. I wonder. Is is this a sign that we might no. actually see SLED go KDE? No, no. You really don't think so? No, and I'll tell you why. There's one big reason why they can't, and that is because... It's mono GTK? Okay, that's another big reason. No, but yes. That's Banshee? Probably, that's probably a bigger reason. Mono GTK and the... Kind of the if you're if you're a SUS Enterprise shop where you have SUS Enterprise servers and you have SUS Enterprise desktops, then a lot of times those shops will run the, their ZenWorks management suite on yeah, top of that, yeah. and ZenWorks management pushes a group policy style policies to sled desktops yeah. via GConf configurations. Oh, do they really? Yeah. So and you gotta so go. You, you gotta, gotta go have GNOME. GConf in order to use the ZenWorks. Well, you can have GConf and not have GNOME as your default, you, you, but you but, have to you have to basically have most of GNOME installed at that point to do that. Right, but but. They but but ZenWorks lets you change things like 
uh, different different lockdown policies for the GNOME desktop. So oh. like certain icons appear, or this oh. user isn't allowed to do this, and yeah. it's all controlled via GConf, and that all requires the full GNOME environment to be you be using. So that. what you're saying is KDE is dead? No, no, no. Obviously no. not. It just got set as the default. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. It's interesting. So this change oh, is going to be in a, this change will be in place for OpenSUSE 11.2 when it ships. So. Yeah, I'm I'm curious to see how that how that runs. All right, Brian. The next story on the news docket. For this week. We have more stories? Dude, we've got a big one coming up. All right, I'm ready. But this story... It, it's not this one? No. Okay, so this one is a story I can ignore. I don't know. All right, so everyone like fast forward about two minutes. You're an Arcos owner, so I think you'll like this. Oh, oh okay. Arcos I know where you're going. Arcos is set to announce an Android tablet with 720p playback September 15th, which I think is the same day Motorola is. Yep. So what do you think of this, Brian? So here's kind of what we kind of know about this. It looks like it's going to be an Arcos device, custom UI, or an Android device from Arcos, yep. custom UI with a widescreen WVGA 5-inch uh, LCD screen, yep. 720p playback with HDMI out, 3G mobile internet, a 500 gigabyte hard drive built in, and as typical hmm. with Arcos devices, like every format under the sun will be supported. 3G? 3.5G actually. Yeah. Is it, do they ha- are they tied to any one carrier? Uh, it doesn't say. It's not announced yet. This is all kind of coming out. But now is this just a tablet, not a phone? Correct. Huh. I. What do you think? Wait, wait a minute. Hold you think on. Arcos can pull this off. I've got a response. Ready for it? Okay. Huh. Yeah. That's yeah. What I yeah think too. I've got nothing. I've got nothing. I th- well, I think it's interesting because Arcos has been doing Linux-based uh, PMP devices for oh, a while. Oh, forever. Yeah. Now they're instead of rolling their own Arcos OS, they're just switching to Android with customizations. Yeah. No, I I, I like that. Do Honestly, that like that's that? okay, cool. Honestly, it seems like a cool toy. I, I you know I, I look at it and like. I love my internet tablets. I do. I love them. Yeah. And this, I this what the looks like it could be, be a great one, but I'm looking at it and I'm like, well, uh, I got the N900. Uh, it's right. going to do everything this does but if this plus is, a lot more. But if this more. is $300 and the N900 oh, is that's $700. True. That's true. That might make the difference. There you have it. That might make the difference So for it's me. interesting to watch. We'll, we'll cover it when, when they make their official announcement. But uh, it's also... Uh, um, plus it might have up to a 500 gig hard drive. That's kind of a big deal. And they're, gonna, they're, they're mm. also coinciding the launch with their app Lib, which is essentially like a marketplace for applications to run on the device. Okay. So what do you think of that? Well... You like, I mean, you like app stores. <clears throat> yeah, I do, but I, I don't know. I feel like why why would you have that? Why not just have the default Android marketplace? Doesn't I, doesn't I, that just splinter the I, marketplaces? Well, I think it's essentially a sub store of the Android marketplace. Oh, okay. So I, th- I don't know if that means you only get access to it or it's going to be like an additional menu item in the Android if, marketplace. If it means that you only get access to this weird that Arcos app store, that would be a huge epic fail. Yeah, I yeah. would say that I they agree. just need to take these to the dump and burn them all. Right, I agree. But no, but it sounds like it's, it sounds like it's going to be like another menu item inside the what Android What do you think, Jeremy? Burn them all? Yes. There he says. Jeremy he says it. burn them all. He has it all. All right, so the next story on the news docket for this week. Now, I debated whether even covering this because... You see, the thing is, Brian, is a lot of times when we talk about the Free Software Foundation, we do it in a negative tone. Uh oh. And the Free Software Foundation has done a lot of great things. I think the GPL is that one of those great things. Yeah. That is the Free Software Foundation of yesterday, I feel. I mean, they just keep screwing up. They just right. keep screwing up. Are, are you talking about their new Windows 7 thing? So they have a Seven Sins of Windows 7, or the Windows 7 Sins. And when they do these kind of is it Windows Seven Sins dot org or dot com or something like like that? that. Yeah. When they do these kind of attack campaigns, they do it in such a negative tone that the immediate reaction to everyone outside of the hardcore open source world is these guys are total lunatics. And if if you think before I go any further, if you think I am wrong, then you live in your parents' basement because you haven't read any (laughs) comments or heard anyone talk about it. Oh boy. Here's my personal experience. A personal story is I, uh, you know, doing this show, have kind of become um, the Linux guy in my circle of friends and family that are not Linux users and with clients that have watched our shows on occasion or listened to them. And so uh, I found out about this through a forum post in the Ju- at JupiterColony.com. That day I went on site to a client of mine and... They had heard about this through, I don't know, some news outlet. I think it was like Windows IT Pro or something. I don't know. I don't know where they heard it. I'm, I'm, I'm making that up. But they were immediately giving me a hard time. 
when they hear the Free Software Foundation does something ridiculous like this, to the general population, they associate it with open source and Linux. And open source and Linux are lunatics because the Free Software Foundation is lunatics. <laughs> oh, man. They're, they don't see a difference there. They don't understand the Free Software Foundation doesn't represent open source and Linux in general. They, they to them, yeah. it's all one thing. Yeah. That is the case for 99.99% of the entire world. Because the people listening to this show are smart people, we know that's not the case. But everyone else out there that doesn't already follow this ecosystem <coughs> doesn't yeah. know that. So when the Free Software Foundation sends out crazy letters to 499 of the top 500 Fortune companies, what they're doing is sending out a letter saying, hey, everyone in the free software world is crazy. Here's a letter. Because the things they talk about in this are exaggerations, they're skews of the truth, and they sound ridiculous. And they, basically, there are there are plenty of legitimate things to get upset there are. with both Microsoft and Windows Seven. Yes. However, if you just ignore those and create these whole new, right. brand new fantasy world things, point number one: they are, Microsoft is poisoning education. All right, that is just sounds. It just sounds it, over the. It top. makes you sound ridiculous. It makes you sound now, like a crazy. Even person. if, even if it's a legitimate concern that we could say, hey, you know what? I really don't feel like the educational institutions funded by government money should be, um, you know, tied to uh, specific corporations. That's a legitimate concern. That's the way a reasonable person That's, would say it. Probably. Now, however, poisoning education—you mean giving them free computers? That how, now. It, all, anyone's going to read that and go, "Wow, whoever wrote this website is insane." Before we move on to the rest of the points, I want to make one global point. What their site is horribly. Ugly. The website looks like it was made on GeoCities in the late '90s. Yeah, it looks awful. Yeah. and here's now go go to the website. I, I don't care. We'll give it traffic. Windows Seven Sins dot org. Go there. Look at it. It's disgusting and awful. the The graphic design on it is awful. It's terrible. It is worse than the worst graphics that we at Jupiter Broadcasting have ever come up with. I know. And we are not graphics designers. And we do it our we do it, like we, and we do it at the website in our like spare time. The show. And these people, these people, this is their job. This <laughs> is what they do for a living. Uh, if you go there, it's awful. Down, scroll down like close to the bottom of the page. Free interns or something. <clears throat> scroll to the bottom of the page. It's got this big thing. Add the Windows Seven Sins widget to your website to start with. Um, the the beginning of that sentence is not capitalized, and it's not an actual accurate sentence. Um, it's centered strangely in this column on the left yeah. that just makes it look like it was written by someone stupid. And, and the spacing and you, is weird. And then you look at the code. Now think about this again. Add the Windows Seven Sins widget. Oh, okay, a piece of interactive functionality I can add to my website. No, it's a picture. They want you to embed a picture. It's not a widget. It's a freaking picture. Yeah. Learn what the difference is between yeah. a widget and a picture. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to point out is, and this is stupid, this is the stupidest piece. The coolest looking part of the website is the top left corner. And it has this little, little if you roll over the top left corner, the page peels away. Yeah, yeah. And it shows you like like the Free Software Foundation goat ram monster. Um <laughs> Why do they even do that? They're sitting there looking at you. What I hate is like, if you hover over it, it changes the page. Like yeah. If you're like, what is this over here? And you're like, oh, let me look and at it. And it immediately goes to it, even if you don't click on it. I hate uh, that. <clears throat> so basically what it does is it makes it look like we here at the Free Software Foundation are spying on you and being evil. We're and behind we're behind this, but we don't want you to curtain. know. <laughs> so it just makes them come across as yeah, even crazier. Half the website has yellow background who the hell uses a giant bright yellow background and brian color? should we mention the the nice God. the nice topper on all of this is the the windows 7.org page is covered by a creative commons non-derivative works license which means the yep. free software foundation does not want you to take the code from their site and redistribute it that is exactly what that means they wrote their website under a non-distributing code a a non-open license. Yes. A closed license. Love the irony. A license there. that goes against everything that the Free Software Foundation claims that they are for. And if you look at Richard Stallman quotes in the last two weeks, Richard Stallman has said the text online should be free to distribute and to modify. Yay. In fact, he was at a Wikipedia conference and said that is one of the few things Wikipedia does right is that the code and language and text on their site is under a Creative Commons license that allows people to make derivatives. And then they put up a web page that doesn't permit that. Yep. 
Love that. Pretty fantastic. All right, so let's read just point number one of these crazy lunatics post. All right, we already got point number one. Let's move no, to no, I want to read the text. Okay, go for Poisoning it. Poisoning education. Now, this is a letter they sent out to 499 of the top. I, it's worth uh, pointing companies out. Companies that we want to get Linux into. This is what they sent. And remember, people out there think that they represent Linux. Jeez. <sighs> Today, most children whose education involves computers are being taught to use one company's product, Microsoft's. Microsoft spends large sums of lobbyists and marketing to corrupt educational departments. And education using the power of computers should be a means to freedom and empowerment, not an avenue for one corporation to instill its monopoly. All right. So let me give these crazy lunatics a little concept of how these 499 of the top 500 Fortune 500 companies work. They all want to be Microsoft. <laughs> They want to have <laughs> lobbyists. They want to have their product be in all of the schools. They want exactly what they are rallying against. So when you say what Microsoft is doing is evil, what you are essentially saying is their goals are also evil. So if you try to speak to them on that level, you sound like you are against exactly what they want to accomplish. Yeah, this, this so goes right make, in the paper shredder. You make it sound like you completely don't understand them at all. You have to come at them from an aspect of why doing something that involves open standards and something that doesn't cost education money and something that teaches people skills that they can be applied in different aspects works not that what they are doing is exactly the same goals you want to do and those are evil because that makes you sound like a stupid moron and really you make stupid. everyone else look stupid because you don't have any control over what you send out because you're a lunatic so now we all look like lunatics that's all I'm saying. It's kind of ridiculous. I, and that I, I just, actually that is just point number one. That is point one of seven. I actually the one that I got me got me the pissed off the most was point number two. All right. And I want I want to read this in full Go so for you it, guys buddy. can really get an idea. Go for it. It's titled "Invading Privacy," and it reads: Microsoft uses software oh, God. with backwards right. names. Hold on, like Windows Genuine Advantage to inspect the contents of users' hard drives. The licensing agreement users are required to accept before using Windows warns that Microsoft claims the right to do this without warning. I have two things I want to say here. First, let's address the backward names. Yeah, bit. let's so, do that. So they say they claim that Microsoft is using backwards names like Windows Genuine Advantage when just a few months ago, uh, <coughs> the Less free than software. A few months ago. Less than a few months. Two ago. months ago, maybe. 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 Uh, the Free Software Foundation came out and did a big press release, did blog posts and speeches talking about the quote unquote Amazon swindle. A backwards name for something. Interesting. Uh, they also they also like to take words like digital rights management and rename it to digital restrictions management. Now here's the thing, I know a lot of people don't like DRM. I don't like DRM. DRM sucks. DRM sucks. However, it is rights management. It is managing rights. It is not managing restrictions because if you that's an entirely different concept. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm okay with saying I hate DRM. DRM is the blows. That's a totally legitimate statement. Absolutely. However, changing a word around it, it makes you sound like a well, crazy crazy are, like guy on on the radio on AM talk radio exactly. just making up words. If you are words. AM talk radio DJ host that's heard by a very 5,000 small market, you can call words whatever you want. Yeah. When you are writing letters that are representing a cause of movement and a yeah. community, when you are making public statements and then also, by the way, releasing press releases to get press for those statements, you need to be careful with the words you use. You need to yeah. manufacture those words and construct them in a way that makes a solid argument and a solid point that people will hear and understand. When you twist words, you sound like a fool. You sound like somebody in high school writing for the high school newspaper. And so when you use those backward words and then you release something that gives somebody else a hard time for using backwards yeah. words. It it's doesn't ridiculous. make any sense. It's ridiculous. The the other thing I want to get because to because they don't know what the hell they're doing. And I'm going to ignore the fact that this this sent these phrases are grammatically incorrect for the most part. I'm going Wait, to ignore well, that. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Heaven's Revenge in the chat room mentions the entire point of the Free Software Foundation originally was to essentially be rights management for enforcement of the GPL. That is exactly, <laughs> and that totally makes sense. That totally right. makes sense. It, it just the way they're presenting this is just ridiculous. The other thing I want I want to touch on is okay. I want to read this again. Microsoft uses software with backward names like Windows Genuine Advantage. So Microsoft uses Windows Genuine Advantage to inspect the contents of users' hard drives. Now let's be clear on this. What is Microsoft doing? They are 
checking to see what version of Windows you have, checking your registry keys, to and see. verifying if they're valid, to see if you're licensed. querying them against right. the server, and then storing a file locally to say whether or not it is. It's basically it's file it's it's software activation. Is it's what actually it is. it's it's actually it's two files. Yeah. I know exactly what two files it is because I've had, I hate I hate Windows Genuine Advantage. I've had to deal it's with annoying this. as heck. I, it's bitten it me is, in the butt so many times. It is times. two files with a hash key in them. And it's so so when they're talking about inspecting the contents of the user's drives, this is this is a very big negative. Now I want to be clear about this: the Free Software Foundation is presenting that software that inspects your hard drives is incredibly bad and evil. Now let's. It must think, be because it's their second point in this letter. That, right, and th- this is how they worded it. So this is a big deal. Well, let's let's brainstorm for just a second. Okay. Let's think of. <clears throat> Let's see if we can come up with any software that doesn't run on Windows. Let's say, oh, I don't know, Linux. Firefox. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, okay, so Firefox, Firefox is an application Firefox that runs on inspects your hard drive more than Windows Genuine Advantage. How about Apt? How about Yum? Yum. How about every package management format and system on the planet has more information about you? And now let's be clear here: Fedora tracks the IP address of every machine and what you are getting and not getting from them. And which this version is, of Fedora you're running. And they've been very clear that they track this so that they can track their numbers. Absolutely, and now, I'm okay with that. Now, we can say that, oh, okay, it's not that big of a deal because you know we know what they're using it for. I'm fine with that. However, it is significantly a larger invasion of privacy than anything that Microsoft is doing here with the Windows Genuine Advantage stuff. Now, does Microsoft do other things to <clears throat> snoop on your Oh, drive? sure. Who knows? Probably. probably. It's probably a safe bet. But come on. If you, have, come on. if you have a Linux desktop and you're running Firefox, you know what? You are, you are constantly sending a barrage of data back to the servers of the companies. And these are companies and organizations who are not companies, but there's both, uh, of, the, of what exactly you're doing, when, right. how long it took who you are, where at the IP address, which well, can translate and, to where you live. And let's also let's also mention uh, a couple of points here. Um, a lot of times, the things that those different, say Firefox or Apt, are doing it over a clear HTTP connection. WGA does it over HTTP SSL. Uh, let's also mention the fact that WGA has been certified by the NSA to be safe for enterprises to use yep. in government organizations without divulging important user information. Yep. I think WGA is horrible. I think it's the it worst sucks. aspect of Windows It, it totally is. It, it, it's it's but awful. you are writing this letter to address to companies that are probably running thousands, because these are Fortune 500 companies, yep. they're probably running thousands of Windows desktops all already having WGA. They've obviously made some sort of decision to move forward with a product that uses WGA. So they obviously don't consider it the boogeyman like this letter assumes it is. Now, I don't want to spend the whole episode talking no, no, about no, this. No. This is just the first two points of this crazy lunatic organization's yeah. rant that they sent out to companies that we want to get open source technology. If you into. feel like getting really upset at the Free Software Foundation, keep reading that website, windows7sins.org. It's, it's, it. it's awful. But uh, I just wanted to point all this out. Uh, it's, it's so defeating because from a personal story, if I work really hard to... Yeah. Talk about the positive aspects of open source software and, you know, like I'm trying to push a client to deploy an Apache server and to deploy a Samba file server. I've talked about it. I've talked about it. I've wrote, I've written them up a nice long project proposal on it. This kind of stuff comes along and to them, this is a baggage that is associated with Linux. And in, in reality, in no way will impact them. And I have tried to explain that. But to them, they are a they are a company, and Microsoft is a company in the United States. And to them, Microsoft is like buying a product made in the U.S. of A. It is a, <laughs> and especially this is very true in yeah. Washington. They're yeah. a local company, and to them, they, there's not this, there's not this crazy lunatic baggage associated with running Windows and running IIS. It's, it's a practical, it's a practical solution from a company that's built yeah. in the U.S. of A. Yep. And then there's the open source version that is free. And why is it free? That's a little strange to begin with. And then there's these guys that are in this open source world that are crazy that say these outrageous things. And if you and go to their web pages, there's these angry looking, weird, perverted goat creatures sitting in the corner of the page that when you roll over them, they appear like I'm spying on you. It. Come on, guys. Yeah. That's it, friggin' it sucks weird. Because 
I, I, how do I how do I argue against that? It's freaking weird, I, is what it is. I, I get into the situation of well, they don't represent Linux. I mean, I sound like an apologist, and I can't sell a service based on sounding like an apologist. We we just we just need to just make the Free Software Foundation go away and focus on like the Linux Foundation. You know what I mean? Focus on groups of people that are just being a little more reasonable. Yeah, and and the thing the thing is is. I'll just, my last point is negative marketing just almost never works. You never really get anywhere with a negative marketing no. campaign. You need to promote the benefits and the positive aspects to something if you want people to switch. So yep, exactly. I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I don't know. It's you don't know. It's disappointing. It's, it's disappointing. It's, it's it's defeating to see this happen. Hi. All right, Brian. Well, the next story on the news docket is a positive note. So let's end on <laughs> Good, that. Let's end the we news can, we can use a little upbeatness here. Haiku schedules their right. first alpha release for September 9th. Brian, oh, I'm pumped. Tell me about Haiku. I am pumped. Now, most of you who've been listening to the show for a while probably already have heard me talk about it a bit, and hopefully you've tried it out or at least looked at the screenshots or something because it's awesome. Yep. Um, basically, Haiku is the open source version of BIOS. Uh-huh. Is basically what it is. Yeah. Uh, the old B incorporated system that almost became Mac and Mac OS 10 before Next became Mac OS 10, and BIOS is phenomenal. It's fast. It's clean. It's slick. It's a beautiful system. Um, it has a whole lot of yellow in the interface. Don't care for that, but you can change that. It's themable. Not a big deal. That's kind of a BIOS thing, <clears throat> isn't it? It's, it's a BIOS thing. Um, the UI is all very tabby. It's, it's very nice. Um, but, but Haiku started quite a ways back and has slowly been replacing all of the different bits of BIOS with open source versions. And we're finally at a point where we have a stable alpha release of it huh. um, where people can really like dive in and really start playing with this thing. And it's incredibly exciting. Yeah. yeah. It's incredibly exciting. I'll show um, people watching the video version. I'll show them a few screenshots because it looks it looks it looks like BIOS what used to, BIOS used to look like. It is exactly. I gotta be honest with it, you. They, they, have not, not they have not changed the look and feel of B, of Haiku at all from what BIOS was. And I, I think that makes sense. They want to get the underlying thing working. Um, they want to get Haiku running very well, and then they're going to transition to you know to, to spruce it up. Now a bit. you've ran uh, recent builds of this. Oh, absolutely. And I, I grab I grab a new build of Haiku every month to see where it's at, and, and, you and said it's the making performance, huge improvements. You said the performance is crazy great. Crazy great. Crazy great. Um, I mean, if you ever ran BIOS in the old days on like an old like Power PC or Intel, you know, depending on their versions, it was this was back when you had like sixty megahertz and one hundred megahertz processors, but when there was a couple of machines you could get that would have, like, say, a dual core power PC chip in it. Yeah. Well, or and, no, not even. Oh, yeah, power. Or PC. not dual core, but dual, dual processor. Dual processor. Yeah, yeah, dual processor. This was way back in the day. Now, and of course, you know, you could run, you know, Mac OS or Windows NT or Linux, and sure, it could take advantage of those processors and see them, but nothing took advantage of them quite like BIOS. Here's the thing That's with BIOS. For sure. Everything is a thread. <coughs> Excuse me. I love that. So like dialogue boxes, everything. A button. A, a button. A freaking is a button. <laughs> now and so that's it's beautiful. A <laughs> so you can have an application that can itself distribute across just dozens of cores or different processors if if you designed it right. Very cool. Uh, so BS is very very cool. Uh, for the next episode, I'll be I'll be doing an in depth review of the alpha version of Haiku running both on uh, native hardware as well as in VMware. So you can kind of okay. give an idea of how it all works. Okay. But uh, this is this is very a very big moment. Um, there's a lot of open source OSs out there. There aren't a lot of them that get me quite this excited, though. I mean, you know, Linux is great. You know, all the BSDs are awesome. O- honestly, um, Eros and Morphos, the uh, the Amiga OS uh, yeah, yeah. open source ones, are very very cool. Um, but Haiku, Haiku is the one I keep looking at. And I'm like, dude, that thing might have legs. That, yeah, that could, could actually see, go somewhere. I, I could see, uh, you know, if if you got it up and running, you got it working, and then. You know, start evolving yep. the look a little bit. Get some applications for the platform. Yep, yep. I mean, it's st- there are apps available and there are games available. It does feel like today's operating systems. I mean, the hardware we are throwing at our systems today it's is insane, insane. Yeah. And I feel like you only get incremental improvements for that hardware. Yeah, but something like this. It. I remember my my experience with BIOS was like, oh, so this is what. This is what this my computer is supposed do. to run like. Yeah, this is what it could be it's, like. It's I remember like just like booting up for the first time. Yep. And it was like a 15 second, 10, 15, 20 second boot while it was de- detecting all of my hardware for the first yeah, time. Yeah, and now, and that was a big deal back then. 
I mean, dude, nothing crazy. did that back then. I mean, well, Amigas did that, but you know, Amigas okay. were already dead by that point. Yeah, they were. And so, and so it didn't matter. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, this really felt like the reincarnation of a highly multimedia, fast, peppy system, which is what Amigas were all about. I would love to be able to edit video on that system today. Oh, I would love it. All I right, would love so it. on uh, the 23rd of August, which is already passed, the trunk is uh, going yep, to be. It's already branched. Yep. Yep. And then they so they've got the hard freeze yeah, there. And so then Alpha One will be hitting on, on September 9th. Yeah. Uh, basically, in about a week and a half, uh, the Alpha will be yeah, out. Buddy. I'll be testing it out up until then. The kind of the pre not quite Alpha, and then I'll be testing out the Alpha, and uh, I'll let you guys know how it how it feels. Yeah, I'll kick the tires buddy. a little bit. I'm excited. I'm looking forward to that. I'm actually very pumped. All right, Brian. Well, that wraps up the news for this week. Awesome. All right, so what we're going to do next is I'm going to intro... Uh, did you see that uh, that HD rookie file on there? We'll play that for the stream. I need to tinkle. And uh, that gives Brian like six or seven minutes to tinkle. I need to tinkle, it's like you a guys. Seven minute, it's like a seven-minute segment. So oh, we have, goodness. Should be. Just uh, maybe crack the speaker just a little bit to verify that when you... It won't come through here. And then we'll run that. So... Uh, let me know. Uh, let me know when you're hitting record on the audio. So just record me introing the segment, and then I'm gonna go back and add the audio separately. So what I want to do, okay. what I want to do is start here and then start here when you're done. And then, and once I'm done introing it, stop recording there. Okay. So give me the give me the thumbs up when you're ready. Check, 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 check. All right, well, so I decided to do a little something special here. I've been looking at different storage options for my home network because editing video and starring all of my HD movies and things like that, I've just had sort of storage sprawl. So I'm going to create a new segment called HD Rookie that I'll run from time to time to sort of spotlight how to do something generally involving HD. I'm kind of starting off to sort of a more general topic this week with a look at network storage. Hello, and welcome to the first installment of HD Rookie. What's HD Rookie about? Well, it's not really so much about the flash and the whiz-bang effect. No, it's more about how we done it. And I'm going to go on a journey with you on what I did along the way to create HD productions and to stream and watch HD video throughout my house. Now, I'm no expert by any sense of the means, really. I'm just getting into this, so I'm going to stumble along the way, which means a lot of these installments will probably be me correcting something I said in a previous installment, but I figure we can learn together, and maybe if I'm really lucky, some of you out there will have done something that I'm trying to do, and you can give me tips along the way, and we can share information back and forth, and if I learn something from one of you out there, I'll share it with everybody else. Now, I plan to cover all kinds of things, right? I plan to cover how I stream HD video to three different HD TVs throughout my house simultaneously from one single network share. Sure, sounds fancy. I also plan to cover how I built this home recording studio out of my garage and how I do a green screen that when you look at it from a separate candle, uh, camera, candle, it looks like a gray screen. Even the audio that I'm using, I'll cover all that, but first I thought I would, I would start with something that's applicable to all of us. Even if you're just watching HD media or 
if you're recording and editing HD media, you need to be able to store it. And that's what this big guy is right here. One of the problems I have is a single episode might be 30 gigabytes in size if I use compressed lossless codecs. So how do I store all that? If you figure I do two, three episodes a week, that really adds up fast. Well, I have the Drobo, and I love it, but it's not quite fast enough for what I want to accomplish. I want to have multiple machines do network rendering off of a single network resource. Now, the, the Drobo I do use for, for streaming using the Drobo Share, but again, the speed is around 13 megabytes a second, not nearly what I need. So I started off on a search. I looked at different products, and there's ready NASes and things like that that plug directly in the network, but they're all kind of limited. That's when I came across this guy. Check this out. $350 shipped with a one terabyte Western Digital Caviar Black Drive. Now that's a fast drive. On top of that, free shipping, no tax. Love that. Eight bay external eSATA unit. Check this guy out. Love it. Stores eight hard drives. Um, specs say up to two terabytes, but then you go on their sites and it looks like the individual drives could actually go from there. Two eSATA ports on the back, connects in super fast connection, comes with an eSATA PCI Express card, very nice. So I don't even have to worry about spending, I don't even have to worry about going out and buying an extra card if I don't have to. Uh, it is PCI Express 1X, which means it could theoretically be a bottleneck, but I don't think that's going to be a problem. And of course, it comes with the two eSATA cables necessary to hook it up doesn't have hardware yeah. RAID built in. It does come with software to do yeah. software RAID. Not a problem. I'm actually going to be using this in JBOD mode. Or I guess yeah. what I should say is I'm going to be using these as each individual drive will represent itself to the operating system. And then I'm going to pool it there. I don't want the overhead of RAID. Now, true, I could maybe get additional performance out of a RAID zero type setup. Angles. But the reason fans. I'm not doing that is I want to be able to add drives as I go. I'm not going to fill this thing with eight drives immediately. I'll start with one drive. In fact, I have a... Uh, the uh, one terabyte caviar black that it came with right here. I'm going to be putting that in this unit, hooking it up and going. Now I've powered it on. It has a 120 millimeter fan here in the back. Not loud. Good, quiet, nice cooling. Um, the power supply is fanless, so it's only the one fan there. I'm not sure when you get it filled with drives how it's going to be temperature wise. But my thought is I'll plug this sucker via eSATA into my file server and share it out. And then that'll be it where I do a network storage for my different projects that I'm working on. And then when I'm rendering throughout the network, each machine will connect to this unit over probably Samba file services and uh, pull down the files it needs. I'm hoping that it works pretty well. The reviews online are pretty good. And I figured eight bays, eSATA, shipped with a one terabyte drive. How do you go wrong? Um, this is the uh, this unit here is from Sans Digital. I don't know if this deal is around anymore. It, it was a pretty pretty limited offer, I think. But either way, I'll give you an update in a future episode. Now, if you have any questions on how we do anything in our productions over at JupiterBroadcasting.com, I'd love to hear from you. Hit me up on Twitter. I am twittercom LAS. There's also that email thing, but I'm trying to avoid that these days because at the time of this recording, I'm like 200 emails behind in my inbox. So Twitter. 140 characters makes life a little easier. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed the first installment of HD Rookie. I am the rookie, and hopefully we can learn together. Here we have it. Are, are, mics, on? are, mics, are mics are still on, right? The mics are on. All right. Wow. Look at that. That was a little segment I made for you guys. How do you like oh, that out there? Wasn't that fancy? Oh, Jeremy, your yeah, 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 speakers yeah, yeah. are still on. I, I, I like it when you do those little segments, Chris. Yeah? It, it gives me time to just, you know, have a little potty break. Yeah, yeah, uh, me too. I, I, went, and I went, and went and took a tinkle. <laughs> yeah, I did too. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. So uh, the uh, uh, eSATA rig has been running now for a little bit, just to give an update to people, and uh, I'm really liking it. I slid, I slid in. I did run it in the JBOD config, and um, nice. I got uh, I got me some storage. You got some storage, huh? I do. Nice. Nice. I'm writing up a little summary for YouTube to let them know that I got an email from YouTube saying, do you own this content? <laughs> like, really, guys? I love it when they ask that. It's like, really, guys? Like, how many times has Jupiter Broadcasting posted, like, I don't know, like, an entire, like, Transformers cartoon? N well... When have we ever done anything like that? One time, I, I submitted a, a, a video on the Miro video player, yeah. and I included a Creative Commons video from them, which I got permission to use, but YouTube flagged it, and so ever since then, now, whenever I post stuff, they'll send, uh. a, they'll send a little thing. So it's your fault. 
I guess so. Nice. Nice job, Chris. <laughs> All right. Is this the uh, Hackintosh, Hackintosh time? time, guys? Okay. Here we go. Um, I don't think I'll have any visuals for you. Oh, you know what I do want to get, though? One sec. Entertain the folks. I want to go, I wanna go get my, uh, my All right. thing. All right, guys. So if there's anything you'd like to ask Brian, now's your chance. Get, uh, see if anybody has any questions specifically to Hackintosh. Right? And if you have any Hackintosh questions, uh, you know, toss them in right now, and I will uh, promptly uh, pretend to read them. And then uh, I will answer your questions about. I have a Hackintosh question. Jeremy has a Hackintosh. What's Jeremy's Hackintosh? Is Hackintosh considered to be derogatory in the technology realm, or is it just a common term? It's, it's a common term. Yeah, it's not really a derogatory term. Right. Yeah, Hackintosh and OS X86 the, are the two terms people seem to be using. Basically means the same thing. Yeah. Hey, what's a song I could sing to them with a raspy voice? What? I was Which one? Oh, that's that's the one with with the right. That's the different part. I don't know if this is gonna get keyed out or not. Singing Ducktales. Does this make it in the video? Or or does this key out? It looks okay. Doesn't key out. Yeah, it looks all right. All right, cool. Oh. <laughs> and the class has been brought in. Okay, you guys. I'm ready whenever you guys are. Now I have a little sip of well, water, that, and then I'll be ready. I think the cocaine is kicked in. The the energy drink, not the... Uh, uh, the ranting won't you know, it always bit. surprises me how long it takes to kick in after you snick crack off of a hooker's uh, bottom. You know what, actually? It? You know it, what takes, always... it takes like a good hour, hour and a half before was, you start hitting it. I was in you, a you know? bad place before this show started, but whenever we, tur- we turn it on... We got this thing that we turn on. We do. It's called showmanship. Okay, I'm ready whenever you are, Jeremy. All right, I'm hitting record on the audio. Uh, Brian? Yes, Chris. We made a little comment at the end of last week's episode, or le- le- fortnight ago. Say what? We were going to cover kind of a controversial topic. It's not really that controversial. It, I mean, it's kind of becoming there, mainstream. Now. Well, it is becoming mainstream. So from a journalistic review standpoint... It's about as controversial as MP3s. We decided to take on a look at building a Hackintosh. Now, why would you want to do this? Okay, so and what is Hackintosh for those who are uh, All right, out so of the know? OS x86 or Hackintosh is running the OS X operating system from Apple, Compu- uh, Apple Inc., on a non-Apple yeah, computer. Apple does not make computers anymore, now, so they drop computer from the, their name. They're just Apple. The the reason, this is why, this might be, for an example, is if you're primarily a Linux guy, or even a Windows guy or yep. gal, yep. and uh, you don't own a Macintosh, right. but there's maybe an application that only runs on the OS X operating system. Or, or you work in IT or as a developer hello, or tester, hello. and you need access to and OS X to make sure stuff's working. Which is, our, uh, which is exactly our situation. Now, and I want to be clear, um, I would absolutely, I would pay through the nose. I would pay like three times like retail price just to be able to run OS X in like VMware or VirtualBox. With box. good performance. Uh, like, even, with even, like with, drivers. even with like moderate kind of works performance. Uh, it, I, if I'm I'm gonna pay three times. I want like drivers. <laughs> I don't know. At this point, I've gotten kind of desperate. Um, so, yeah. um, you know, that would be nice. But Apple uh, says that you cannot do that, um, and they do make it as hard as they can. Right. So, uh, so, so then that begs the question. And the uh, the other side of it is there are huge gaping holes in Apple's hardware lineup. Oh, this is a great point, actually. Yeah. The- so, so let's say like I have I like netbooks. I I, I used to be a big laptop guy. Um, I did everything on my like desktop replacement. You laptops. and I both went through a phase where we said. Desktops are dead. Yep. Laptops, what we're doing. And I've gotten to the point now where I'm a big desktop guy with a netbook augmenting my desktop. I so agree. I have a netbook that I take with me everywhere. I, I went completely back. I went yeah. big desktop, small notebook. Yeah, that's how I am now too. And honestly, it's been working phenomenal. I love this route. Um, so I've got a big desktop rig. However, um, I can put together a system. And, and of course, everyone wants to complain about, oh, Macs are expensive, whatever. But the reality is I can put together a system for half the cost of a Mac Pro that runs 
considerably faster with a lot more custom components, yeah, like yeah. better graphics cards, yeah. all sorts of stuff. Plus, yeah. I, I have my machine at home is roughly on par with like a kind of like a low range Mac Pro right now. Um, and it's totally whisper quiet, silent. I can't get a Mac that's like that. Now, let me they cover, don't actually exist. Let me cover a couple of points. So we talked about there's a hardware gap in the Apple product lineup. So if you want a, a customizable desktop, you either yeah. have to start at the Mac Pro price, right? Uh, which is which is high. Or, it's very high. Or you have to not have a customizable machine, and you have to go with an iMac, which has no upgrade path and also uh, has... Uh, you're you're locked into dual core, and if if two processors right, it's just enough, not going to cut it for me. Uh, now, and and yeah, and really, I need like a nice couple of monitor setup. Um, yeah, and, you know, I, and I an iMac is never going to cut it. A Mac Mini isn't going to cut it because they're just not that fast. And, they're overpriced right. for what you get, and they run very very hot. In the U.S., a Mac so, Pro's tower, the base tower. Starts at twenty five hundred dollars. Good Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. There is no way I would spend twenty five hundred right. bucks on the machine with that spec. So now here's I mean, what, it's just it's just so, so wrong. It's ridiculous. Here's here's kind of a system that I built with the intention of try booting, um, and I built this system at a price point to seventeen hundred dollars. So it starts with the the main thing if you're going to build a desktop Hackintosh is yeah you kind of want to have hardware that is. Um, Similar to the hardware in like chipsets that Apple might have, and one of there's different chipsets out there, and I wanted to build a Core i7 rig. Apple doesn't actually sell a Core i7 no. processor, the desktop version. They have their their Xeon version. But uh, so to start with, I did some research, and kind of the sweet spot out there right now is the Gigabyte X58 UD4P motherboard. Nice board. Um, and what's very nice about this board is it uh, it's actually just if you were not even building a Hackintosh, it's just a fantastic motherboard. Uh, uh, it has uh, plenty of slots for memory. It has very nice constructions. It's thick. It, it has it has won the award over and over again for one of the most overclockable oh, systems yeah. out there. Yeah. Um, but what's really great about this board is it supports, or I guess I should say, it allows you to use something that allows you to run a legal retail copy of OS X. And I think this is kind of an important thing to consider because if you're going to run a commercial operating system then you should legally buy and pay for that commercial absolutely. operating system. Absolutely. Absolutely. I just want to be very clear right up front. We do not support or condone piracy or stealing software in any way. That's a no-no. Right. Big time no-no. So one of the things you can do is your, your, your initial issue, the, the getting off the ground, the problem is uh, PC machines, uh, regular non-Macintoshes use a BIOS. A Macintosh uses the EFS or EFI uh, replacement of the BIOS. So a company came along, and I forget the—I don't think their actual name is EFIX, but uh, they make a product called EFIX. Yeah. And the EFIX plugs into USB, a USB internal port on your motherboard. It doesn't plug into an external s plug. It has to be one of the motherboard slots, and it only works with certain motherboards. The Gigabyte uh, EX58 UD4P is one of the few Core i7 motherboards that this supports. And what this EFX I is, it is a compact flash with an EFI environment on yeah. it. Your motherboard BIOS boots this EFIX compact flash, which has EFI essentially on it, and then that boots Mac OS X. So Mac OS X loads normal, like it would be booting from an EFI uh, system. Very, very cool. So that means... You can put in uh, OS X Leopard, the DVD from Apple, into yep. your drive and install that. Yep. Nothing else required with this EFIX chip. Now, the downside is this EFIX chip is generally around $200. You're still, uh, I was still, including this price, be, I was able to build my Core i7 rig for $1,700 with the price of this EFIX chip included. Now, $1,700. Now, I mean, I mean, think about that, though, for a second. So, since the base low end. Uh, Mac Pro, we're looking at right. twenty five hundred dollars. So you're right. saving like seven hundred bucks, right? right. And eight hundred bucks. And my price includes uh, two LCD monitors, which is not part of the Mac Pro no. price. No, uh, two two LED backlit LCD monitors. Oh, they're nice ones too. Apple's only LED backlit monitor is eight hundred dollars. Good lord. The other ones are fluorescent backlit. <sighs> uh, so mine are LED backlit, and uh, they. Uh, uh, including the price, also is also included in my price is 12 gigabytes of memory. Apple's base system ships with six gigabytes of memory. So twice the memory uh, plus two free monitors. Also, the memory is faster. <laughs> so there's that. And you've got a Core i7. I've got a Core i7, which is just slick. Which I'm running at four gigahertz. So what? How fast is the uh, the low end Mac Pro running? The low end Mac Pro is now 
uh, my mine is looks like eight threads because the Core i7 has a new version of hyper threading. Right. The uh, low end Mac Pro is a quad core, but yep. also has the ability to show eight each, threads. Yeah. So yeah. you essentially get two core i7s, two quad cores with four right, thread, right, right. Uh, uh, eight threads each or whatever. Um, but their base, their base speed. Oh, oh, oh. I, obviously, this almost goes without saying. Is my video is substantially higher than the video that yeah, ships? Yeah, yeah. You can't you can't get that nice of a video card from Apple. You, they can be okay, but not the, great. Uh, the uh, the Mac Pro ships with a two point six six gigahertz two Xeon two point six six. Now these are and Xeons. Now, uh, there's nothing to sneeze out there. Those are no. that's a nice chip. And, it's and faster the, than the, heck. And the core i in the core i seven world, a a two point six gigahertz is essentially going to do a lot of things faster than almost even a 3 gigahertz core 2 generation would. Right. So there's a, there's a little bit different of a skew there, but you, you're you hard fixed with that speed setting. You can't and that's, change that. It's done. Yeah. And for some people, that works great. Um, for others, it doesn't. But you know what? For that price, I want to be able to upgrade. I want to be able right. to slap in right. new, new hardware. I, yeah. feel, I feel like I bought that when I, when I buy a pro, a quote-unquote pro rig. A pro rig yes. means to me expandability, dependability. Know, exactly. Right? Preferably. And the other thing is, is... And if I'm doing audio and video work, I need a silent rig. Yeah, and you need... And this is just absolutely mandatory for doing high-definition high editing. You yeah. have to use a... RAID to access your data off of because right. the amount of data that HD uncompressed video or compressed video requires cannot be successfully supplied by a single hard drive. This Mac Pro ships with one 640 gig hard drive with no hardware RAID controller even built into the system. Yep. This Gigabyte board has a very good Intel Matrix hard, hardware, hardware RAID. RAID. It's, it's a software hardware RAID, but it's, it's, but it's hardware RAID. RAID. It's not controlled by the OS. It's, it's generally considered very good. Um, I have five hard drives in my machine. This now has is that one included hard drive. in your price? This motherboard? Yeah, and and, yeah. and then the price that you gave does that include all the hard drives? Uh, all but one, yeah, because I already have. So one. so four times the hard drives in a RAID. So and still eight hundred dollars right. less. And mine are the caviar blacks. They're not the whatever Apple's using here. So they're the cheap ones. I believe they mostly have like Western Digital still. So they uh so now okay so we've made the case from a price point which most of you already know. Um, but I, from a functionality standpoint, if I need to be able to boot into OS X, boot into Windows, or boot into Linux, I yeah. can all do it from one box. Um, this EFI chip, this EFI X chip, lets me run a legal copy of OS X. Uh, I think, you know, this probably um, against the Apple EULA. I'm not sure, but... Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not case. sure either. I mean, that's. <coughs> but you I'm made not the a case lawyer. now. So that's the high end. You also made the case of there's not really a, a market. So if you're if you're on site consulting, you're at work, at your job, whatever it is, yep. and you want to be able to try something in OS 10, and what you have with you is your netbook, right? Unless you want to drop, uh, you know, nearly two grand for a net uh, for Apple Air for uh, a MacBook Air, MacBook and, Air. and a MacBook Air is still big and underpowered. Yeah, it's, I mean that's it's, that's the reality. Yeah. It's still not small. It's actually. Huge. It's bigger than a MacBook. So the MacBook Air starts at fifteen hundred dollars. Fifteen. You can buy five netbooks for that. Five of them. Right. Five different netbooks running five different operating systems in your bag all at once, or one MacBook Air. And the reality is, the MacBook Air, it's a nice little piece of hardware. Sure, you know we all saw the 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 commercials where oh it slips inside a Manila envelope. Well, you know what? My netbooks do too. It's just a bulky vanilla envelope. So you know what? <laughs> it's so what? It still fits. It just has a lump instead of and a the nice rea- flat. The reality is, I mean, who needs that? Do, do you, are you ever sitting around going, "Wow, I put my laptop in that Manila envelope, but it's just not flat enough. It's it has a bulge. My Manila envelope has a bulge. I don't like my Manila envelopes. <laughs> the, oh. So so okay. So so the MacBook Air is crazy overpriced. We get that. Now, the netbooks is a sweet spot. Now, even if you're a Mac guy, you've got your Mac Pro at home, you've got like a MacBook Pro, and that's the thing that you do. That's great. But you still, if you're like a lot of us, you want that little mini portable. Yep. And uh, they're, they're all pretty much the same. I mean, that's the reality is. When you get into the netbook world, they're all running on the 1.6 gigahertz Atom processors for the most part. A few of them are running Celerons, like uh, like the early Triple E's had the, yep, had the like Celerons, nine, the 900 megahertz is, Celeron. Yep. And it's, it, those, are, those are still good machines. Um, but here's the thing. The 1.6 gigahertz... Um, Atom processor. It also has kind of that that pseudo pretendy dual core yeah, thing. Yeah. Yep. So you know Linux and Windows and and OS ten all see it as a dual core processor, which is kind of cool. And so you're rocking. Did you already mention you're rocking the HP one thousand? So so yeah. So this is what I've got to work with. I've got the HP Mini one thousand, uh, which is rated as 
not the most OS tenable machine, but, but the it's second, close, the right? second, yeah. it's, it's rated as a close second next to the Wind, right? Next, right, right. Uh, the MSI Wind is basically uh, the MSI Wind and the Dell Mini. Uh, oh, Mini Nine, yeah, yeah. yeah. Those, Which they those, don't make anymore. Those two laptops are basically the laptops if you want to run OS ten on them. It's supposed to basically be the way to go. Uh, yeah. The the Mini Nine is the one. Uh, the wireless chipset's right. The video is right. You just slap OS ten on there and run around like a happy pants. Now I'll mention just a quick aside. Uh, I also my, now my wife is totally our, the company we work for the same company our whole company is is all Macs yeah and so her wind runs OS 10 and uh, at the time uh, MSI was not really so here this is a funny story so when I bought when I built when I built uh, Angela her her little Hackintosh uh, wind they uh, didn't have drivers that were really worked that well for her for her wind so I swapped it out with a with another mini PCI yeah. card that worked great. Then about three weeks later, MSI came out with an official, well, unofficial, an official unofficial driver, driver for, right. for OS X. So it's obvious that MSI has seen a ton of sales. Even the for hardware their companies are recognizing and that this really, is something <laughs> people want to do. Well, and it's funny, like, well, this is unofficial. We're just going to post it here in our forum. Well, of course, that got Google linked like crazy. So. Like crazy. Yeah, it's everywhere. But so anyway, sorry, that's an aside. So my wife's using it on her MSI Win. So those those are two good ways to go. The, the third way that people point to is the HP Mini 1000, uh, which works very well out of the box, except for uh, again, you need to have like Wi-Fi drivers and uh, an updated video and driver to work? take advantage of everything. Yeah, sound works okay, totally fine. Good. Um, <clears throat> so I got it on here, and if you're diving into the Hackintosh realm, the OS X eighty six world, there are a lot of different ways to get OS ten onto your machine. Uh, the the best way, in my opinion, is the way that Chris uh, showed previously, where you can actually have an EFI BIOS on a USB stick. Yeah, that's totally awesome. Not an option for no, a netbook. No, and not an option for most hardware out there because you have to have that specific motherboard that will work with that EFIX chip. Yep. For most of you out there, you're going to have to go like the OS X, OS X86 distribution route. Right. Which seems like you're going more often to and maybe See, not so here's, legal realm. So here's here's where I have a problem with that. So so there are there are a few options. Um, there's a couple of basically bootloaders that you can get. And if you're willing to work fairly hard at yes, it, you, yes. um, you can get it booting yourself and use your retail copy of OS X mm-hmm. and basically you have to remaster it. So you end up having to um, you know copy it to like a flash drive and yeah. replace a few files and, you and it's a, a major you have a, you, What you do is there, you install a bootloader on your hard drive and you make an EFI-like partition where Right. You load different EFI stuff on there, and then uh, the bootloader boots that, which then boots OS X. And it's, but it involves like inst- multiple installations. It's, it's, it's a many phase process. It's not a simple process to get going. There are great tutorials uh, out there. If you just do a search for OS X86, HP Mini 1000, you'll find lots of tutorials. They, 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 there's no lack of that. And they're great tutorials, and people have gone through the, the process of getting this working right. Yeah. Um, so I, I did. I, I, I tried it, and it was a pain in the butt. Um, It was a real pain in the butt. Even the simplest installation, even if you look around and say, okay, I'm going to go with the distribution route, the one that basically is, you know, technically you're downloading a copy of OS X that's been modified. Even if you look at those routes, um, it's still a many-step process where you have to hop into, like, the basically the equivalent of root mode and and copy around some some drivers. If you want to use one of the nicer bootloaders. Right. You can also load... um like a like a, a hacked bootloader, which is more of a hacked version of the OS X kernel, yeah, and and load without doing all the multi partition stuff. The downside is is updates. You, the your OS updates will break your right. System. So that that's the big concern is is when you update any software, eh, your your whole system's host. Yeah. Um. So so anyway, I got it running here, um. And after I f- finally finished monkeying with it for hours and hours, yeah. Sound worked. Wi-Fi worked. Webcam worked. Everything nice, worked. Nice, uh, Quartz Extreme, which is kind of their accelerated graphics side of things, worked just fine. Um, in fact, the performance was oddly incredible. Um, on This is, again, HP Mini 1000, 1.6 gigahertz Atom processor. I have two gigs of RAM in here because, well, why not, right? <laughs> uh, you wouldn't have one. RAM is so cheap. <laughs> why are people not buying just tons of RAM nowadays? I don't know. It drives me crazy. I, uh, I think two gigs is minimum for a netbook. And desktop, you need at least eight. That's just what I say. Anyway, um, it ran oddly well. Now I've got you know a Mac Mini at home um, that uh, you know it's a it's a newer Mac Mini. Also has two gigs of RAM. Um, really, not much of a performance difference between the two. Um, 
applications launched in about the same amount of time. Uh, I didn't notice any issues running a lot of apps. I loaded up Photoshop, ran mm-hmm. just fine. I've uh, noticed the same thing on Angela's Win. The performance is now granted. Quite good. Um, now, if I'm sitting down to do like let's say video encoding, obviously it's not going to do yeah, quite as well. No, but yeah. but, uh, but for day to day usage, uh, anything not just word processing and web browsing, but almost any sort of app, it runs great. Uh, then I went to update this, the the actual system. And stuff went south. Uh, suddenly, the uh, the microphone stopped working. The wireless stopped working. I managed to get that working again through jumping through a bunch of hoops. Um, and even then, the wireless only works if I take out the battery and put the battery back in before every time I boot the machine. Nice. And it eventually got to the point where it was driving me crazy. Now, that's not OS X's fault. It's, you know, we're, we're running it on a system it wasn't designed for, using drivers that, it, you know, it wasn't necessarily made to go with. Um, so I, I get that. I'm not going to hold that against OS 10. Um, but then again, I'm, I'm looking at this and thinking, is it worth it? it? You know, I don't like, think it is, to be honest. I, I, mean, I don't think it is either. If but, you but got maybe like if you went like the mini nine route or you went. And it worked out of the box. Yeah. If it really, really genuinely worked and could I could update like and not have problems. on a netbook. Yes, I think then it would be worthwhile. Yeah. But honestly, you know, it's not really that worth it. Then again, though, if you need something like this, I can dual boot OS well, 10 you know, and Linux and Windows. So I guess I can triple boot never on my netbook. It, if you never touch any configs, it generally it just keeps working. Yes, if I never update and just never tweak with anything, it'll it'll keep working. Um, but that's not that cool. No, that's just not that and, cool. And now Snow Leopard's out, and it's a whole and that's a whole other. I haven't even tried and that. It seems like so I can't speak. It seems to it. like the ideal solution would be well, I only need to use OS X for troubleshooting, so I'll run I'll run a you know a nice config yeah. Linux desktop as my main OS or a, or or whatever you want to run, and then I'll run OS X inside VMware. Right, that so would be ideal. I looked into this route. Even tried running some of the Hackintosh distributions under VMware. None of it really works that well. There is some early development in drivers for video for OS X. Kind of what I generally found out is if you want to run OS X under VMware, one, yeah. uh, Apple's license does not permit it unless you're running it on another Macintosh. Uh, yeah, there and, is and that. And you're running OS X server. Um, and then the other thing is, is if you want to go outside that realm, it looks like kind of the only thing that will work is OS X.4. Which is frankly old. I mean, it's two OSs behind now. Yeah. It's, it's, it doesn't help me for troubleshooting. I need to run what my current clients run. Right. So there's not a great OS 10 under VMware route. No, you're already not. running on a Mac with OS 10 server. Right. There, there just really isn't. There's and and this is this is all this is Apple's fault. I, I really mean, can't believe we're at this position. <clears throat> I mean, it's it's 2000 freaking nine, Brian. That's a really good point that Chris just made about two thousand freaking. I mean, virtualization is here. It is. It is virtualization capabilities are becoming built into processors, and it just seems like if you let me, let me are think for a second. An OS, let, me, let me just think for a second. Okay. See what what can I run under VMware or VirtualBox? It runs really really well. I can run any version of Windows, mm-hmm. any version of Linux, mm-hmm. all the BSDs, mm-hmm. Haiku. Haiku mm-hmm. Um, all the like Eros and, and Morphos, uh, Open Solaris. Um, wait a minute, every operating system on the planet except OS X. Pretty much, it, and there's no technical reason. Well, and well, here's Apple a, just really doesn't want to. The solution throw it. ends up being, I mean, your best case scenario is OS an OS an Apple machine with the other operating systems under VMware. But I can't get the machines I want from Apple, and it doesn't. It's not even a matter of whether or not it's got an Apple That's logo on my it. My point. That's what we covered I at the top of the. I can't actually do it. So it's yeah. it's kind of a bummer. Um, now, it, <clears throat> the OS ten x the OS x eighty six route is doable. It's not ideal. No. It's really not ideal, um, and it, uh, honestly, it's not a great long-term solution. It's a stopgap measure, at best, um, especially is. especially in the portable market. Now, if you've got a desktop and you can get one of the nice USB EFI chips, that's so a bad. way to go. It's that's not better. so bad. It's better if you're going you the do netbook all the route. System updates. You can do legal copies of OS. You know, 10. even even with all the drivers available, it's not ideal. Um, but it, it can be accomplished, and if you can get it running, the performance is actually good enough to where you're like, you know what, this is a decent laptop. Honestly, this is faster than the old MacBook I used to have, so, <laughs> I mean, that's that's not so bad. But, uh, you know, overall, not worth so it in the you're end. Back, are you back to uh, Linux? No, actually. No? I've moved on um, I, because we've got to prepare for the Windows 7 review. Oh, are you trying Windows 7? So, so I've decided that while, you know, I, I had Ubuntu running on here for the longest time, and I'm like, you know what? Um, I went through OS 10 and it was driving me up the wall. And I'm like, you know what? While I'm already pissed off at the operating system I'm running on my netbook, let's just take it a step further and see how far I can so go So now with you're this. trying Windows 7? So I'm running Windows 7 um, and seeing uh, and seeing how it does. I, I put, uh, I put if 
from our last episode, I put Jolly Cloud on uh, my Triple E. Yeah, I really want to play with and that. And I still have Jolly Cloud on here, but it's a private invite only. Um, my Triple E battery seems to be totally dead. Oh, but one of the things I found out is the later versions of Network Manager have built in support for my Verizon USB Air Card. Oh, nice. Yeah, so I'm really. Nice. I'm going to see if the version of the ship with Jolly Cloud supports that because if I can get my 3G Verizon Air Card on and my just have it going all the time and have a Jolly it. Cloud, oh, that's rad. Right? Yeah, yeah that's so way I'm, cool. So I'm, I'm going to try that out uh, over the next week. Uh, I got to get my battery replaced and then um, I get my uh, get my Air Card on this thing and see if Jolly Cloud's version of I think it's like a layer build of Ubuntu, so I would think it should work. I and think so. And then yeah. um, I could have an always connected Triple E PC. That would be really That'd be really rad. So that would be way rad. There you way go. Way rad. All right. Well, we just wanted to kind of t- cu- uh, touch on the Hackintosh thing because it's definitely yep. a huge thing right now. I mean, it's so big that the hardware manufacturers are starting to release drivers for unofficially OS X on their machine. So it's interesting. It's very interesting. All right, Brian, that wraps up. Oh, the my gosh. Hackintosh segment. Can you believe it? Audio's clear. Audio's clear. Oh, yeah, Daniel. Oh, okay. I'll mention that, Daniel, at the end of the, uh, as we wrap up. Yeah, we're going to wrap now, and I'm going to mention an email from Daniel. Daniel sent an email. I got all going, and I just totally forgot. Are you ready to hit it? Uh, is it pronounced I echo? How do you pronounce that? I at coast. Oh, I don't remember. I at coast. Yeah, I at coast and I didn't are the two. The two big ones. Project Morris, hit <coughs> me up in the uh, forum, and I'll do, a, I'll do a spec there. Because I don't want to bore... I think people are, are barely sticking with us for the Hackintosh stuff as it is. Yeah. So, um, all right. So, let's let's roll, and I'm ready when you are. Okay. Do you want to... You, you kick it off, and then I'll, I'll cover Daniel's email. We're at the end, right? Okay. I do believe that brings us to the end of this week's Fancy Pants broadcast. Yes, sir. And... All good times. I'd like to mention that if you'd like to find any of the stuff that we use to produce our shows, you can find that over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Slash store. Slash store. I wanted to How amazing I wanted is to that? quickly uh, touch. Um, I had a I had a, a listener write in. Uh, his name is Daniel, and he sent his experiences with ha- with his Hackintosh because I had shouted out on Twitter that I'm going to be doing this segment. And this is kind of an interesting thing. He took his Dell Optiplex GX280, yeah. and uh, he wrote he loaded I at cost. I'm not quite sure how you pronounce it. Is the it's the latest version? It's version seven. It's one of the. Yep. Uh, OS X86 distributions I looked at, and uh, it's a pretty well. Um, cons- it's people really like this one. They do this. The developers of this one put a ton of effort into it. Latest drivers and things like that. And uh, he he ended up having some trouble with his Ethernet, which you will run into. Yeah, that Video and bit, Ethernet yeah. seem to be the toughest thing. With yeah. p- so he got Ethernet resolved by replacing with like a USB Wi-Fi dongle. Basically, you just go out and you get an adapter that works with a Mac. It'll work with your Hackintosh. Yeah. And then his video was working, but in Visa mode. So he ended up replacing it with a. Uh, GeForce 8400 GS, nice. which is, you know, basically if you get a video card that's in a Mac out there, you're just going to work in your Hackintosh. Right. And uh, so now he's rocking his uh, Hackintosh going with in, on his old Dell, or I don't know about old, but, and, you know, it's funny because he obviously wasn't, he obviously not really had much exposure to OS ten, which... Apple, if you would just release it for general PCs, you'd get a whole new crew of customers of that wouldn't, would Seriously. That don't want to buy your hardware but want to try your OS, which obviously is where Daniel was at. It's funny because he made comment that um, the the way you install applications under OS X was was kind of new to him. You know, where you could yeah. just drag it in there and delete it and things like that. You just like copy that. files around, yeah. But he also made comment about how he found it kind of difficult once he got a lot of windows open to to navigate through all the different open windows, and he went and got a program to let him switch. Uh, Daniel, you need to embrace. Uh, Expose. <laughs> He's in the chat room right now, so I, uh, I wanted to be yeah. sure I covered his email because he'd sent me his. Uh, he had said, "What's that?" I agree with Daniel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jeremy, who is also not a Mac user, agrees. He sent me a few pictures. It's pretty cool. It's it's you know it's it's a very nice. Uh, hey, Jeremy, bring up my screen for the people watching the uh, video version. So he's got <laughs> he's got an Ubuntu sticker on there and an Apple sticker and along with the Windows stickers. <laughs> Daniel, I believe that uh, nice. the uh, the. Apple Terms of Service for OS X says it just needs to be an Apple-labeled computer, and you do have an Apple sticker on there, so no, I believe there we you go. are legal, sir. He is legit. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, Brian. Well, that uh, is kind of what Ooh, we legit, wanted to cover almost. in this episode. It's a big episode of the Computer Action Show. But it is a big episode. Only the second episode, too. I know, and you've got uh, some nice stuff planned for yeah, next episode. Ne- next week's going to be very, very niche. It's going to be kind of a funky episode because uh, we're going to be covering haiku a bit, um, and that, that should be a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, just because, you know what? A lot of these, a lot of these smaller operating systems really don't get a lot of love. Uh, the I big tech it. shows don't cover them, and there's no really good little tech shows to cover them. So, you know what? That comes right here. Whoa. Right here on the Computer Action Show. Whoa. And That's what I'm, we do. I've got, uh, I've been working on a little benchmarking, and uh, if it's ready, I don't know if it's going to be ready yet, um, it's going to be so looking at the different performance levels of the recent Linux distributions, OS ten versus uh, lin- recent Linux distributions. So that's going to mm. be kind of an interesting comparison. Nice. And then um, I kind of wanted to mention something big where we're doing. Oh, yes. Let's get into this. This is kind of a big deal. Uh, before we mention that, though, if you'd like to get a hold of us, uh, there's a few different ways you can do it. Head over to jupitercolony.com. In there, the, right now it's the Linux Action Show form. We're gonna make. We're gonna keep that, and we're gonna start a computer action show. Yes, form. sir. But right now it's all in the Linux Action Show form. And then additionally, you can hit us up on Twitter. I am twittercom slash LAS. and I am Brian Lunduk, all one word. And I am also on face- twitter.com. I am facebook.com slash LAS. Yeah, same thing for me. In fact, Brian I'm, London. I'm, you know what? I, I originally was kind of a Facebook hater, but I'm kind of getting into it these days. Yeah, I'm kind of getting. I'm spending more time on well, Facebook, less time I on know, Twitter. I yeah. Know. So okay. So anyway, kind of a big deal. Um, Brian. Yeah, it's all because of Farmville. That's what it is. Yeah. Jeez. Brian, uh, myself, and Jeremy are all kind of big Star Trek guys. We're we're nerdy that way. In fact, there's probably yeah. nothing bigger in my life than Star Trek. <laughs> there's just a it's just true. It's, it's pathetic, but it's true. Yeah, that is true. Uh, yeah, Chris makes a good point about how pathetic he is just there, you guys. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we should all really focus on the pathetic nature of this. I think that's more important than anything else. So what we're going to do, we mentioned, sort, we kind of alluded to, towards it at the top of the show, is yep. we're going to start a Star Trek online podcast. We sure are. It's, and it's great. I love the name. We can and it's So the, the name. So Star Trek Online, of course, everyone is just abbreviating STO. S-T-O. So we're like, well, uh, first we were like, well, what do we call this? We call this STO podcast? STO, Sto show? Cast, the STO show? The STO stop. And then, and then it hit us. Stoked. Because what are we for Star Trek Online? We're stoked. We're stoked for Star Trek Online. Yep. So uh, this is going to be a show, and it's just about Star Trek Online. And it's going to be a little Nothing more casual. Else. You know, the computer action show is very... Uh, we, we It's the big, big show. It's the big show, and yeah. we do a lot of work towards that. Stoked is going to be, you know, we kind of have everything Star Trek related in our DNA. Uh, probably a lot yeah. of it's going to be done over Skype. It's going to be a, a primarily, at least until the game launches, it's, an audio it's show. It's three guys kicking back, talking about Star Trek online, yep. talking about what Cryptic Studios is doing, and hopefully maybe getting a few folks from Cryptic on yep. to, to chit-chat it's with us. It's literally going to be crack open a beer and BS yep. about Star Trek and gaming for a bit. That's pretty much the it's gist. Pretty, it's going to be a pretty casual show. So. So, and I think, are we doing it weekly? Did we sign? I don't know what. We're I think decided. we're gonna. We're probably gonna aim. It's, for it's gonna be. It's gonna be weekly to bi-weekly for a while. One, yeah. uh, once the game launches, so, things will change. For the most of you, you know, it's 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 going to be probably primarily for a new audience. But if some of you out there are huge Star Trek fans, then feel free, feel free to just tune in and check You're it out. Always more than welcome. It's kind of it's kind of going to inhabit the Castle Blast slot for a while until uh, that show returns from uh, break from from hiatus. All right. Good times. I think we touched on everything on my list for I the I do believe we do. Segment. Now, if you have any questions about uh, Haiku, BIOS, uh, where that's going and whatnot, uh, drop by in the forums. For the time being, just use the Linux Action Show forum. Uh, ask your questions in there, and I will take note. There you have it. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Computer Action Show. We'll be back in a fortnight. All right. Thank you, sir. Oh, we're out. All right, so uh, I think we'll probably stop the video recording there because normally you get to see Brian try to do the intro, but I think we're probably getting pretty close to over a gig, and then we won't be able to upload to any video sites. Okay. So uh, do you want to hit stop in Wirecast and then hit stop in Ustream and name it?